So I like to welcome you all to our Tuesday seminar of the Finnish Society of Natural Philosophy. So today we have a very special opportunity to hear about the astronomy tradition in India from one of today's most famous Indian astronomer and, and uh, uh, cosmologist, Professor Jayant Narlikar. And let's a little bit look at Professor Narlikar's background. He's now the, uh, the, or, uh, until he until his uh, retirement, he was the director of the Inter, uh, Inter University Center for, Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics in Pune, India. And uh, going back in time, he got his BSc degree in 1957 in, in India, continued his uh, studies in Cambridge in mathematics, and, and uh, then uh, directed to astronomy, and he worked for many years with uh, uh, Professor Fred Hoyle in Cambridge until 1972, and uh, came back to India to serve as professor in Tata Institute for uh, Fundamental Research. And in 1988, Professor Narlikar was invited to set up the Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, which became an internationally acknowledged center for excellence in teaching and research in astronomy and in astrophysics. Also, uh, Professor Narlikar served as the president of the Cosmology Commission of the International Astronomical Union from 1994 to 1997. So let's go to the, to the uh, astronomy tradition now. Please, the audience is yours, Professor Narlikar. First of all, I would like to thank my hosts for a very enjoyable time that we are having, my wife and I. And <clears throat> this is my first visit to your country, and it is uh, bringing very good impressions all along. So I thank you all for your warm hospitality. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about the tradition of astronomy <coughs> in India, in my country, uh, which dates back to very old times, which are associated with the Vedas. And I want to develop how the subject has evolved from the Vedic times to the modern uh, times of, uh, well, I wouldn't come to the right away to this present modern times, but I would go to pre-colonial days when the colonial powers from Europe began to come to, to India. So uh, let us uh, uh, start this with, yeah. Uh, how do I change this? This is okay. For oh, this, is. all right. <coughs> so, <coughs> so as I mentioned, early times, uh, I am referring to the Vedas, which I will come to very shortly. In the Indian tradition, the very early knowledge was supposed to be part of the Vedas. And Vedas, there were essentially four volumes, and each volume has got its own speciality. And the main point that one wants to uh, emphasize here is that the Vedas carried on uh, from one generation to another through an oral tradition. 
That means they were not written down, but they were uh, sort of memorized, and each teacher would pass on these to his uh, students, who would memorize, and then similarly it will go on. And uh, as you see, it says here that they were finally written down around 1500 uh, uh, BC. Uh, that means we have today, if you ask what is Vedic literature, then you have something written up. But you have to remember that it came after a long time of uh, uh, oral transmission. So uh, <clears throat> we come to the next uh, point that <clears throat> in the olden times, in the Vedic era, uh, mathematics and astronomy were greatly respected subjects uh, altogether. That means if you look at all different branches of knowledge which existed at the time of when the Vedas were uh, actively being followed, uh, at that time, uh, astronomy and mathematics were singled out for special respect. And <clears throat> there is a uh, verse which uh, in Sanskrit reads like this, Vedasya Nirmalam Chakshu Jyotish Shastram Anuttamam. What it means is that the Vedas have very high level of high quality eyes through which they can see. And those eyes are identified with mathematics and uh, astronomy. So this was the uh, impression uh, given to uh, anybody who wants to know about this Vedic uh, literature that it highly respected uh, mathematics and astronomy. <clears throat> now, there is also uh, a comparison made uh, when describing these knowledge, these uh, items of knowledge, uh, comparison made with the top of peacock's head and the precious stone carried by cobra. That if you look at the peacock, the peacock has on his head uh, a, a kind of uh, uh, special uh, uh, identifying mark. What do you call it? Uh, yes. So you you see it in in the, in the form of a uh, two or three. Yes. So uh, that. Uh, is identified with the top of the peacock's head, that is the most prettiest part of the peacock. Peacock is a very beautiful bird. And uh, the second item uh, with which it is compared is with the stone which is carried by the cobra, which is, uh, although not a, a very uh, pleasant thing to handle, but it shows that the cobra values that stone very much, and that stone is very much valued by astronomy. So these are the two uh, indicators, again, of why people uh, looked, of how people looked upon these two subjects in the old time. <clears throat> now there were social reasons why these two subjects, mathematics and astronomy, went hand in hand. Because the, the tradition demanded that you hold special festivals or special occasions uh, depending on what you see in the cosmos, in the sky, which stars are being seen at the time of that year, would decide, in a sense, what religious activity you would perform. So special occasions, special positions of heavenly bodies were needed. Uh, and people, in order to plan this, wanted to know when do you see which, bod uh, which stars in the sky. And for that calculation, you needed mathematics. 
So this is one reason why mathematics and astronomy uh, went uh, together and were regarded very essential. <coughs> and likewise, one had to be prepared for the so-called bad days, that you don't do certain things on certain days. These were, of course, uh, the uh, kind of beliefs which had come in those times. Uh, but given those beliefs, it was uh, people would like to know when to avoid doing that, a certain thing on a certain day. So th this was also provided by uh, astronomers and uh, mathematicians. So when you look at the old books, which originated from Vedic literature, you find one important uh, volume, is, which is called Shulva Sutra. This is the collection of results mathematically derived for various rituals. So results known at the time, well before they became known in Greece and Europe, uh, include the Pythagoras theorem and the Diophantine equations. So if you ask, uh, <coughs> did Indians know about Pythagoras theorem? The answer is yes, in Shulu Sutra it is described that if you draw a right angle triangle, this square of the hypotenuse equals the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Now there is one difference though between the Indian tradition and the Greek one. The Greeks were very keen to prove certain results, that is the notion of certain basic assumptions or postulates on which you base geometry or any branch of mathematics. And then when you have a certain result like Pythagoras theorem, you would like to prove it in terms of the basic structure of Euclidean geometry. In the Indian tradition, the notion of proof seems to be absent. Instead, people felt that if some certain thing was correct, it was true anyway. Why bother to prove it? So the uh, statements are just made. And if you want to know why, they, why you say so, they say you, you verify it will always turn out to be right. So that, that was the uh, attitude. And same thing about Diophantine equations, uh, which uh, were associated with Diophantus much later, but the same ideas of uh, those equations you find in uh, Shulva Sutra, which was a kind of uh, volume written around the time when Vedas began to be written up. <coughs> you also find that for calculation in astronomy as well as uh, anything on the ground, uh, the pi was an important uh, constant. The ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle. Now, Shula Sutra writers seemed familiar with the irrationality of pi, that pi cannot be written as exactly as a ratio of two uh, whole numbers. Uh, they also had um, made approximations which went very close to pi. So one of the approximations is shown here. Uh, it's it's an unusual kind of approximation. You might wonder how he, uh, the person who thought of it, how did he th think of it? So, uh, of course, there is no uh, logic given. And uh, it, the statements are simply made that this is so it is said that this particular expression is close to pi, but not exactly pi. So that they knew that you cannot make an exact valuation of pi in terms of uh, rationals, that is ratios of whole numbers. <coughs> then in 1881, in an archaeological site about 70 kilometers from the village of Bakshali near 
Takshashila in today's Pakistan, that is northwest frontier in, in that region. Uh, this uh, Bakshali was the place where uh, archaeological finds showed up a manuscript uh, which is known as now as the Bakshali manuscript. The manuscript describes quadratic equations, square progressions, etc. Now that means you have arithmetic and geometric progressions. The formula were described and how to take make square roots of numbers. Uh, if they are not exact perfect squares, how do you get approximate values? And quadratic equations, how to how do you solve them? These are described in the Bakshali manuscript, which uh, dates back again to very, very early times, uh, similar to uh, Shulva Sutra or later. Then you find that there are six volumes uh, describing the knowledge contained in Vedas. As I said, Vedas were uh, verbally orally trans, uh, transferred from one generation to another. But ultimately, when they began to write them down, the uh, sh Shad Vedangas, Shad means six, and Vedangas are the parts of Vedas. So six parts of the Vedas, the original uh, sources of knowledge, were written up in, uh, in this uh, fashion uh, as six volumes and Vedanga Jyotish. Jyotish means ast astronomy. So the Vedanga Jyotish is the, uh, that part of the six parts of Vedas which deals with astronomy. And Shulva Sutra is part of one of them and Vedanga Kalp, Kalp stands for rituals. Now you ask, why are people interested in astronomy or mathematics? The original motivation was they were related to their rituals or, or religious uh, practices that were uh, required uh, in those times. And uh, of all these different uh, religious uh, rituals, and those dealing with astronomy are seen in the Vedanga Jyotish. So one could ask uh, who, who uh, collected together Vedanga Jyotish. Now, according to the information that is so far available, there was one uh, wise man, sage, uh, called Lagadha, who uh, wrote wrote up all these uh, items of knowledge relating to astronomy. And this is one of the earliest texts to come out of India. So if you want to know when some manuscripts began to come from India, this was at the time of Vedanga Jyotish. We'll come to see some idea of how long it takes and how long it took, etc. <coughs> So when I said, how old is this text? People naturally ask we, when we give certain uh, express, uh, certain volumes, they would like to know how old or when they were first written. Now the dating by the observations of precession of equinoxes. Uh, so what you have is the situation that you have these equinoxes which slowly rotate through the period uh, uh, at the rate of one degree per approximately 72 years. So what happens is if you look at the pole star, the Polaris, the pole star is, is supposed to be a, uh, at rest in terms of the spin around that uh, axis. So the polar axis goes through the pole star and that's why the pole star is fixed as we spin around. But that axis is also precessing. And that is why uh, at this particular rate, you find that different stars will become pole stars or 
along the axis of uh, spin. So this is known, and since it is known how, how long it takes to move around the uh, cycle, uh, one can do ev evaluation of uh, <coughs> uh, ages. So one of the examples was the dating of some of the statements uh, in uh, old literature like Vedic literature. Now, Tilak was uh, a, a religious leader, a social leader, a political leader, and also interested in mathematics. I mean, he had a math, uh, mathematical skill also. Now, Tilak noticed when he was reading the sacred uh, book of Hindus called the Bhagavad Gita, or Gita simply, that the Lord Krishna, who tells this story of, uh, tells the uh, philosophy to Arjuna, his uh, disciple or friend, uh, how he should behave and so on. This whole Gita was started when in the beginning there was this battle between two major sources. And before the battle could start, Arjuna said that he doesn't want to kill anybody. There are all my friends on the other side. Why are we fighting and so forth? But then uh, Krishna was the, uh, his teacher as well as his f friend. He tells him, no, you ha you, it is your duty to do it, and he justifies that war. Now, in that in, uh, statement, <coughs> in the, 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 there are some 18 chapters. In one chapter, uh, Krishna describes the best of each thing in the <coughs> existing world. So he says that, <coughs> excuse me, he, <coughs> he, he says that amongst the months, no, sorry, among the seasons, uh, the best is spring. So that, of course, you, you would agree with spring is a nice, uh, part of the, uh, nice of the four seasons, or so six seasons, depending on how you look at it. <coughs> but he says that the best month is Margashir. Now, the Margashir is somewhere around October. So why did he say that the best uh, uh, period, the uh, best season is spring, but the best month is not, apparently not falling in spring, but is in October. So uh, what uh, uh, Tilak argued was that when Gita was written, uh, the uh, time, a lot of time had elapsed. So you have this precession of equinoxes, and that made uh, the uh, Margashir was the first month uh, belonging to spring, first month of the year. And so you said, you, you, let us calculate when that happened, and that gives us the age of uh, Gita, when Gita was written. That is the method that people many times follow. Now, this method is astronomically correct and good, but uh, sometimes people argue uh, whether the statement made is uh, is correct or uh, or has been put in at a later time. This is one of the problems of Indian literature, that many of the things stated to belong to a certain period were actually inserted much later. And experts have to distinguish between the, si uh, the type of wording used to decide whether it was it belonged to the same period as the rest of the text or it was put in later. So th this is something one has to keep in mind. So <coughs> when uh, uh, Tilak made into made this particular uh, statement and w worked it out, uh, there was, of course, uh, uh, 
he wrote a book or a manuscript. Uh, it is called the Orion. It's a small book, but <clears throat> it carefully reasons out why he and how he calculated it. And that method is what I just now described, that you see how the equinoxes are precessing, and that would change the season. And there was a time when Margeshirs was in spring. So that was the uh, situation. <clears throat> now, continuing this dating uh, process, in Lagada's time, the winter solstice was at the beginning of the constellation of Shravisht, Delphina. So in Varahmir's time, the winter solstice was at the end of the first quarter of Uttarashada. So these are, again, identifying certain thing, constellations in the sky and trying to see whether you can date what has been said. So this is a shift of angle 23 degrees, 20 seconds. Uh, and at the above rate of precession, this shift occurs in 1,680 years. What is being done is that Varamihir was an astronomer who had made a lot of observations. And at his time, he had uh, looked at uh, when the winter solstice happened. And when the winter solstice happened in Varamir's time, and when the winter solstice happened at the time when Lagad wrote, uh, they were not the same time. So you have to again do this calculation. And since Varamira was around 530 AD, this is known from other evidence we have. Uh, the time of Vedanga Jyotish therefore comes out by su subtracting 1680 from 530 AD. You get something like 1150 BC. So this is how people uh, evaluate some of the ancient writings in, in our uh, in Indian tradition. So now uh, I will come to the later stage I mentioned. Varahmir. So Varahmir belonged to what we call the Golden Age. And the Golden Age started with the Golden Age of Indian astronomy and mathematics. So that started with Aryabhata and it went on till Bhaskara II. And that in terms of uh, dating uh, to, from 5th to 12th century. That is the period over which this golden age <coughs> is, is, uh, is recorded. So let us start with Aryabhata. He was born in 476 AD and wrote his great work Aryabhatiya uh, in 499 AD. He, he knew and used spherical trigonometry and astronomical data for, uh, was often required by physical, uh, by, for processing by spherical trigonometry. And he had prepared very accurate sign tables of angles in multiples of 3.45 degrees. So now you can ask why, why 3.45 degrees? You go on dividing uh, the right angle, you will see. Uh, the, uh, 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 3.45 uh, denotes breakup of a degree into 60 minutes. So he was familiar with timing and um, measuring angles uh, very, very small. Now, <coughs> now there is one uh, interesting uh, aspect that I wanted to uh, mention. Let's see if it is <coughs> uh, yeah, uh, here itself I can say that. When these uh, trigonometric tables were made, they were trying to give you the value of sine theta for theta at, at different angles. Now, uh, the method used by Aryabhata was using some kind of extrapolations 
from one side to other. And the Greeks, on the other hand, used some geometrical calculations and came out with similar tables. And when a comparison was made, as many of the Western scholars who had been experts in this, they said that the uh, method used by Aryabhat was more accurate than what the Greeks had come up with, using this kind of uh, uh, extrapolation method. Now, in his book, Aryabhata states that he makes a statement which is, uh, which turned out to be very provo provocative, that just as an observer on a boat sees fixed objects on the bank going in opposite direction, so do stellar objects appear to go westward even though they are really fixed. So the argument was that the earth is spinning and this is because of the spin of the earth we are on a moving platform and, and he gives the example very rightly of a, uh, in, in those days the most uh, sort of uh, effective way of travel was the boat, boat through rivers. So uh, if you are going in a boat, you look at the trees on the bank, they go in the opposite direction. L likewise, fixed stars are really go appearing to go from east to west. So, uh, he made this statement. It is there in his book called Aryabhatiya, which I mentioned. Uh, <clears throat> but, of course, uh, th th that was not popular. People were uh, believing in the Greek uh, dogma of uh, uh, what you call the earth is fixed and everything goes round, round the earth. And one can see the reason that the Greeks had come with Alexander to India. And Gre Alexander had brought a number of uh, philosophers and thinkers with him. So some of them remained in India and there uh, ideas got uh, sort of uh, discussed. They were, of course, discussed, and finally, people, many people, accepted those. So, the uh, what you call this uh, geocentric theory was uh, also firmly rooted in India at the time of Aryabhata. And <clears throat> so, when he went against by saying that the Earth was spinning, uh, people did not like it. So what you see in the uh, uh, writings, that you either see some people very firmly saying that Aryabhat never said this, that the earth spins, uh, that the stars go around because, because they appear to do so on a spinning earth. So he never said so. Uh, and somebody said that others may have put it in the book afterwards. So this is to make uh, an excuse for uh, apparently somebody whom you respect greatly. How could he make a statement as silly as that, that the earth is not fixed? So to, in order to do that, uh, they said, he didn't say this, but somebody else has put a verse in, in him. Another way of peop people getting out of it was, that they said, uh, Aryabhat uh, had said this thing, whatever you see is there, but Sanskrit language uh, is known to have many me uh, uh, sentences with many meanings. So the same sentence could mean differently depending on how you put the syntax. So some people have spent a lot of e effort in trying to show that that particular verse belongs to Aryabhat, all right, but he didn't mean what it says. It meant something else. And they tried to twist it to mean something which, is not, which was not disturbing to the period in which it was written. And then the third type was this, a very straightforward statement by a fellow astronomer who was actually his, one of his pupils' pupil much later. He said Aryabhata was a fool. Don't 
trust what he says. So this this was why Bra- Brahma Gupta was one of the leading astronomers in later times. So <clears throat> after Aryabhata, uh, then came Varamehra, uh, whose name I took earlier, with ancestry dating back to Persia. He, his family uh, earlier belonged to uh, Persia, Iran, and they migrated from there. And he was from the family of sun worshippers. So amongst other things, he classified comets according to the shape of their tails. So somebody, uh, I attended once a seminar given by uh, a a scholar in uh, Pune, in which he had taken uh, a whole range of uh, Varamira's writings and analyzed them and shown that they were describing the different shapes of tails which comets have. Comets keep coming and going. So that was one of his uh, achievements. So <clears throat> uh, coming next to Brahma Gupta, on occasions very critical of Aryabhata, this, when he said Aryabhata was a fool, that was uh, putting it very strongly, the contributions made by him uh, by Aryabhata were generally appreciated by Brahma Gupta. And th- it so happened that Al Biruni, who was an uh, Arabic scholar, uh, who was interested in the writings of uh, Indian scholars, he studied Sanskrit and translated uh, many of these uh, books into uh, Arabic. And that is how many of these books have remained in a sort of existence. Uh, so Al-Biruni, the Arabic scholar, did ap- appreciate both the Indian astronomers, which were uh, Aryabhata and Brahmagupta, and translated into Arabic their major works. Now Al-Biruni has said uh, in many places that the Indian uh, astronomers seem to be uh, unaware of what is really good and what is really bad. So they pub- go and write everything, and some of it may be right, correct, and some of it may be wrong, but they don't bother to uh, check this. So this is one of his comments uh, on the works of uh, Indian astronomers he translated. Now, <clears throat> Abdus Salam, who was a Nobel laureate physicist, uh, f- born in Pakistan, uh, was uh, uh, had once made a speech in Bangladesh, it, it was at that time East Pakistan, uh, in which he described an event which had happened long back. He says, it is his, his own writing or his words, Almost exactly 1,200 years ago, at the time when this, he made this statement, Abdullah al-Mansur, the second Abbasid Caliph, celebrated the founding of his new capital, Baghdad, by inaugurating an international scientific conference. To this conference were invited Greek, Greeks, Nestorian, Byzantine, Jewish as well as Hindu Hindu scholars. So it was a really international conference by the standards of those times. So uh, <clears throat> from this conference, the first international conference in an Arab country dates the systematic renaissance of science associated with Islam. This is what Salam is saying. The theme of the conference was observational astronomy. Al-Mansur was interested in more accurate astronomical tables than available at that time. So he wanted the uh, experts to prepare a more accurate set of tables of astronomical uh, uh, objects. 
he wanted and he ordered at the conference uh, being the caliph uh, head of the whole uh, organization uh, a better determination of the circumference of the earth uh, no one realized at that time but there was read at the conference a paper destined to change the whole course of mathematical thinking this was the paper read by hindu astronomer kank on hindu numerals then known to in uh, then unknown to anyone outside india so the uh, method of going to 10th place 11 and uh, 100th place writing it in a in the modern way that we know uh, this was what kank spoke on at that meeting and people did not know this method people were more aware of the roman way of writing numbers and so on but this is something that salam draws the attention to that this became uh, at the time of the conference it was relatively new but later became established <clears throat> now one comes to bhaskara 2 space is inadequate to highlight the contributions of bhaskara 2 uh, an eminent astronomer and mathematician who made several seminal contributions to theoretical astronomy as well as to observational one his mathematical prowess is seen from his solution of this equation 61 x square uh, you can try it yourself if you like plus 1 is equal to y square now you have to find x and y integers not fractions or irrational find uh, the lo uh, lowest numbers integral numbers uh, that you uh, that will satisfy this particular uh, result so <clears throat> bhaskara had a solution of this problem using what is called chakraval method he gives the method of solution which gave the smallest numbers as you see what how big the smallest numbers are x equal to 2 2 6 1 5 3 9 8 0 Uh, almost like a telephone number and y equal to 17663190498 so these numbers uh, remember this is pre computer days and the person had uh, no other uh, technical uh, help but uh, adding subtracting so what happened was uh, in 1657 much later the french mathematician ferma raised this problem to solve that particular equation <coughs> which was solved by euler in 1732 so you can see how long it took the western astronomers to solve the problem later it was realized that bhaskara had solved it in 1150 so uh, that is an indication of uh, bhaskara's maturity in mathematical operations <clears throat> so the buddhist philosophy said now coming to bhaskara's uh, supposedly uh, contribution to gravitation the buddhist philosophy said said that a stone tossed up falls on the earth because it is dif had it has different speed the idea was that the earth is moving and the stone is moving the stone is moving faster so it catches up with the earth and falls so to this bhaskara argued that the effect is not because of speed difference but because the earth attracts the stone however he does not go go into detail to say why he, uh, he says so and what is the evidence of uh, this in terms of let us say the planets going around the sun and so forth so one could argue uh, that uh, this this gives a, some credit to bhaskara to think of gravity the real uh, contra, uh, the, the real uh, discovery was made by newton because he had the mathematical ability to work out many problems related with gravitation now bhaskara was also uh, familiar with 
elementary calculus. So while working on spherical astronomy, Bhaskara used some results from differential calculus. Like he writes d sin x equal to cos x. Here dx is supposed to be 1. Uh, so that is mis missing. And he also came to this conclusion that a function f has maxima or minima at a point where df the der derivative is 0. So these things were known uh, to Bhaskara at some level. Now Bhaskara's astronomy volume is the book called Goladhyay. And it deals with several astronomical problems like retrograde motions of planets, eclipses, sunrise and sunset, long days and nights near the poles, etc., followed by problems to be solved in each particular case. So uh, what, what one finds when one reads Bhaskara's books, uh, one finds in his writings Bhaskara had included uh, several problems, uh, so, sorry, so included solved problems as well as exercises. Like a teacher who wants to teach a subject, uh, he had cre uh, created a whole lot of problems to be solved by the student. Uh, so he re appreciated the fact that uh, in order to st know the subject, you should be able to solve problems on it. So the book on mathematics is called Leelavati. Uh, and it is supposedly directed at his daughter of the same name and is full of delightful problems. So he has this book, Leelavati, shows uh, how he had very interesting problems for his daughter to solve. So uh, one problem from Leelavati, if you want to solve it, is here. A square root of half the total number of a swarm of bees went to a multi tree, followed by another eight, eight ninth of the total, total. One bee was trapped inside a lotus flower while his mate came humming in response to his call. So, O oh lady, that is Lilavati, tell me how many bees were there in all? So, this, this is the kind of shloka, uh, all are in verses and nice uh, locations and uh, circumstances are described. Now I come to post-Bhaskara development. The major work on astronomy seems to have slowed down after Bhaskara. However, some work of advanced nature came from Kerala and it was discovered by the British East India Company in an unexpected way. So. Uh, pe people thought after Bhaskara there did not seem to be any major work coming out of uh, Indian uh, astronomers, but it turned out to be not correct. Uh, two officers of the East India Company, uh, Benjamin Hain and Charles Wish, in the first quarter of the 19th century, noticed that some local astronomers were using advanced mathematics in their data reduction. They were using power series and uh, up to certain terms what the approximate answer is and so forth. So they, uh, how, how did they get this information? Where did they get it from? Because it had not yet been uh, discovered in Europe. So uh, what had happened, the searches revealed a chain of mathematicians from Madhava uh, through Nilkant Somayaji, then Jeshtha Deva, Achyut Pisharti, Pannikar, etc. This was in the, Madhava was from 1340 to 1425. And what these people had derived were trigonometric series, like series for pi, pi by four uh, is a series uh, uh, 1 minus 1 half plus 1 third, etc. So the Gregory series, uh, what is called uh, uh, the series for pi. So recently a lot of research is being done to learn about the work of the Kerala school because that those things were there in the literature, 
but they were uh, ignored and nobody had looked at them. So now experts are looking at them. Many of them are in local language of Malayalam, not even in Sanskrit. So sometimes they, uh, you read, you need an expert in that language. But this is being done now. So uh, <coughs> what I want to now uh, end end with uh, is is short discussion uh, uh, of the following kind. Why did India lose momentum in astronomy and mathematics? That is, uh, if you look at the way the Indian uh, progress in astronomy and mathematics was there in the golden period of Aryabhata to Bhaskara, they were certainly way ahead of where Europe was compared to Europe. And uh, even if you include, then you can include the Kerala mathematicians who had also derived some somewhat uh, sophisticated results. So uh, this momentum was there, but it was slowing down, and then it seems to have uh, slowed down altogether. So the question is, uh, why did this happen? So one one can give the following reasons why science in India slowed down uh, after essentially Bhaskara uh, two. So first of all, well, and this was pointed out by Salam, Abdul Salam himself, that there was no royal patronage for science in India. Now, if you look at the famous Indian kings and the Mughal kings were very powerful and they were subscribers of uh, arts and uh, literature. So th these kings, uh, they, they also were supporters of music. They encouraged music a lot. But they don't seem to have encouraged science. So nobody uh, had the idea that if he does some scientific research, this king will give me some patronage, uh, whereas in Europe this used to happen. So uh, this, why did this, uh, why did the kings not realize the importance of science? Uh, one example Salam gave was that the uh, Taj Mahal was built around the same time as St. Paul's Cathedral. Both are very sophisticated examples of architecture, different architecture, but sophisticated in their own right. But in Britain, after this uh, event, th there were uh, developments and science came through Newton. There was Newton and his followers, and science became suddenly uh, very uh, powerful. Whereas uh, in uh, India, there was no corresponding event. So science remained neglected at social and uh, royal, royal levels. The second point was benign living conditions. See, in Britain or in Europe in general, you find that there were extremes of cold uh, at uh, in the uh, during the course of the year, and uh, people had to learn to live, and so they uh, had to create uh, energy which will produce uh, heat, and so on. So this led to uh, improvement in science, scientific development were required to improve the conditions, and this uh, was not uh, the imperative in India where the weather is, it, you can complain about very hot weather, but you can survive. You can go and sleep under a tree and you are all right. But in Britain, if you have, uh, if you had a kind of cold, very cold weather, you, you couldn't survive unless you learned how to protect yourself. So that that is the point. There was no incentive to invoke science in order to improve one's living conditions. 
Another point was, uh, and this is uh, some, where one can blame the religion also. The uh, Hindu religion uh, ma many times encouraged this belief that uh, if you are good in this particular incarnation in your life, in the next life you will get a better deal. So you behave well today and the next uh, your life uh, you will be better off. So uh, that was uh, the situation and in so people did not bother to create good living conditions. They said the uh, the, the, it doesn't matter, I can survive, I will be rewarded in my next uh, life. But the, that also did not encourage uh, growth of science for any practical purpose. Then lack of curiosity about nature, this was also a point that uh, was there, it, it, it was not uh, uh, the uh, 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 one, one can give you give, give an example that I mentioned that Vedas were transmitted orally. Now, when you have oral transmission, you don't make any change in what what you know. So, what you know today, the same thing will be repeated in the next generation and the generation after next, and so on. So, there is no evolution of knowledge, no growth of knowledge. And that can lead to, uh, so that is certainly not the way science would progress, that you just keep repeating what science you knew, let us say, uh, if you had Newton, so just keep repeating what Newton told you, you are not going to make much progress. So uh, you see that the, these re reasons were there, the, <coughs> the, then, sorry, uh, then what uh, next thing was, uh, and this is a typical example uh, to uh, demonstrate this point. Uh, there was an event uh, of a transit of Venus, which was to be seen in a certain year uh, during the, I think, 17th or 18th century. I don't remember exactly. And the British and the French sent their uh, astronomers to India to do the observation because the weather was expected to be much better. So the French people uh, asked their man to go to Pondicherry, which is the Fr French uh, uh, part of India which the French had conquered in the beginning. And the English sent their man to Madras, which is in, uh, which was part of the victory, uh, the part of, won by the English. Now, Le John Till was the Frenchman who went from India, uh, from uh, Paris to India. Now, on the way, he encountered there was this seven-year war going on with Britain. So certain areas were not safe to go in. So he had to change his direction, go by some different route. And there were other problems on his way. And uh, by the time he reached India, uh, he found that the date had gone. The, you know, the transit had happened and he had missed the boat. But then he, his calculation showed that another transit would occur about seven, eight years later. So he said, I will wait here, do some work, and observe it next time. So he d did some work, uh, astronomy work, and uh, waited for this next uh, occasion. The next occasion came, and it was clouded couldn't see anything. Both, the only consolation to him was that the, his uh, English counterpart also had clouds in Madras, so he couldn't see anything either. So uh, uh, that, that was the thing. Then he decided to go back. So on the way back, he had a shipwreck 
and uh, then he had to somehow make his way. And by the time he reached Paris, he discovered that he had been legally declared dead, and his uh, uh, relatives had con taken up, taken all his uh, money and all his uh, estate. So he had to fight court cases, uh, proving himself alive and so far. And finally, the end, it ended well. He had he lived happily ever after. But the problem that I want to make out was that he, here are astronomers coming from half the way around the world uh, to make observations, but there is no mention of any Indian astronomer wanting to see transit of Venus. There had been, would have been several occasions, <coughs> uh, several region, uh, re regions in India which, where they could have been granted uh, clear sky, but nobody seemed to be bothered. So this is an example that curiosity about nature was not there, and that might have caused this problem. So I, what I want to end up with is that the <clears throat> why science in India slowed down, one needs to wor worry about it, because uh, if it is something basically wrong with the Indian temperament, then it may happen that uh, again something might happen and they, st they will stop uh, getting interested in science. And sometimes I do get worried when I see very bright Indian st students not opting for science but opting for some other subjects which are maybe m much more lucrative financially, but uh, then contribution to science may uh, again be slowed down. So uh, with this kind of uh, statement, I want to conclude my presentation. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. So thank you very much for your presentation. I think there are some questions from the audience. It is uh, true that astrology and astronomy got mixed up in uh, India quite early on. And in fact, when you say Jyotish, that is the word uh, for astronomy, it means a, a subject which deals with bright objects. Now that got uh, more and more to mean uh, astrology, you know, telling the future and so on planet's influence and so on. So uh, what has happened is that astronomy uh, in uh, Sanskrit is now Kagol, which is a different name. So its own name it had to abandon because it got uh, uh, mixed up with this uh, uh, astrology part. So uh, even today, uh, if I am sitting around at, at an airport and somebody recognizes me and comes and starts talking to me, he will ask me some question about astrology, thinking that I do astrology. So this uh, confusion with astronomy and astrology exists even at a very high level and we have to keep fighting against Any other questions? Yes. 
Sorry, can you repeat it because I could, didn't hear properly. I shall repeat every word that I said, if I can remember correctly what I said. Thank you very much for your very excellent presentation. And as I mentioned, I do not recollect having found myself sitting so enthralled in this very room for a very long time for a period of about 50 minutes at a stretch. I didn't feel the stretch. I think the reason was that the concentration that I was able to offer myself this time was something very natural. I didn't have to strain about it. The numbers you presented were sometimes small, sometimes longer, but they were enveloped by an understanding. So I did not have to look for the understanding in the numbers. The slide that we see at the moment interested me the most. And my question relates to this very slide that you so kindly presented. In the context of what Bharat finds itself today in. Would you be kind enough to explain how many of these four reasons that you have shown us today would, in your opinion, explain the deficits that you yourself have observed among some of the bright students that you mentioned. Is it because... Uh, what was it? Okay. Well, they relate to today's conditions, these four reasons. Mm -hmm. We relate to? Compare it with today's conditions and that is, what is your opinion? Well, <coughs> the, these are four reasons I have put, put down. There may be more reasons also, but... Uh, the significant point is that uh, uh, there was in, indeed a complete slowdown of science in uh, kind of uh, post-Kerala region time. So I, I have no uh, particular uh, sort of explanation, but I would say that this is uh, for plus some more reasons are what, what about today? Yeah. No, that today, uh, what is what happens is uh, <clears throat> that uh, people like uh, young young men who, who should be doing science, many of them, uh, are diverted from science towards uh, careers which are much more uh, lucrative. So, uh, like information technology or uh, what you call uh, <coughs> management. So they earn much more and so they don't go for science even though they are basically, maybe basically the best brains available for it. That's my statement. Thank you. You mentioned that Aryabhata understood the, uh, the influence of observer's motion to the, to the stars observed or the objects observed. How close do you think he was the, the, the Copernican type solar system? He used uh, spherical trigonometry in his calculations, which also indicates that... The, you mean the, in are, are they, which, which time, in the old times? Or? Yeah, I, yeah, I mean that, uh, that uh, 
do you think that uh, Aryabhata was close to a solar-centered planetary system mm -hmm. in, his, in his thinking? Yeah. So okay. he lived about 1,000 1, years before Copernicus. Yeah, yeah I, th I think uh, he, he had got one part right, yes. that is, uh, Earth is spinning around an axis. Okay. Uh, but uh, there is no mention of Earth going around the... Okay, yeah, so he understood the, the yeah. rotation of the Earth, yeah, but not yeah. necessarily the... So uh, one has to uh, sort of think of... Uh, <coughs> Probe some of his uh, uh, shlokas or the verses yes. much more carefully to see whether there was any hint of his suspecting okay. that things go around the sun. Yes. You know, that, uh, but at the moment, with all that was clear, that particular verse is that about spin yeah, around yeah. an axis. And when do you think that? The the uh, spherical form of the Earth was understood in, in India. Oh. All Greeks did, because Erastus <coughs> yes, was yes, one who yes. measured the, the circumference very accurately. Oh. I, I think it must have been uh, known when, uh, at the time when Alexander came. Alexander the Great, yeah. yeah. At that time, certainly, yeah. it must, from, at least yeah, from the Greeks. About 300. Yeah. DC, yes. Yeah. But I, I have no uh, specific okay. date in mind. Okay. <laughs> Perhaps one can put some less than uh, you know, the known before this. Or, I see. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think about 300 BC. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Heck. early astronomers, as it is also today. And uh, uh, my question is, has Moon had a, any special role in India among the astronomers in the early days? So the answer. How about Moon? So the question was that, that what was the importance of Moon to, to uh, um, uh, Indian astronomers so that did they look that moon had some specific meaning or well <coughs> moon had a role in indian calendar you know the months are essentially following the lunar months which uh, so were then the corrected after 3 or 4 years you no know, like leap year is so this this has uh, the calendar was sufficiently well developed even today that in uh, lunar calendar is used for many uh, de determining many festivals of India. Yes. But this is simply to keep in touch with the uh, uh, religious sentiment. I mean, people know how moon goes around the sun and what is the what are the motions. So th that is what I would say. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Tark. About the moon, what was the main important difference between Indian and European calendar and when European calendar was officially accepted in your context? What was it? Yeah, the, the difference. Uh, difference between European calendar and Indian calendar, and what were pro probably the reasons that, and, and when did Indians uh, uh, take into use the, the European calendars? Well, I think the European calendars must have come to India through the British, okay, because they were ruling India effectively from, from, from uh, let us say, beginning of 18th century. Yeah. So by the, then they were they had certainly introduced the European calendar. At the same time, the, as I mentioned, the religious part of the life was still controlled by the Indian calendar, uh, like the, the festival of Diwali, which is festival of light. The dates would be determined by what the moon was like. 
at what phase it was. So th that that is the difference. I mean, effectively, uh, in Hindu calendar was used for religious purposes, but for practical. We, we still have in use two more calendars in India. One is Shalivahan Shake and the other one is Vikram Samwat. And they denote the powerful rulers in India at different times. Shalivahan Shake is 1800 and something. I do not remember the exact date <coughs> because now we are following the Western calendar most of the time. But in many religious festivals, they give three different calendars. The Western, Gregorian. Shalivahan, which is, which has less number of years, and Vikram Samvat, which has got more number of years, and they denote the victories of Indian kings and when they started the calendar. Okay, yeah, Tarko. Philosophical or religious? Yes. <laughs> well, the uh, uh, Indian uh, view about the cosmology, as they would call it, the nature of the universe. Uh, one of, <coughs> if you uh, you find that uh, there are supporters of both uh, Big Bang and uh, oscillating universe, you know, without any beginning or end. So, in in one the, the, the uh, oscillating one, you have Brahma creating the universe and Vishnu is protecting it and Shiva is destroying it. But then it is reborn and, and Brahma again creates and so forth. So this time scale, uh, which has been given in the scriptures, comes out as 4.32 times 10 to the 9 years which is very close to the cosmological time scale today that people talk about Big Bang universe. So, but that, the reasons were quite different, how, how they got this number. These were related to how planets move around the sun and or how they move around and come to the same position again. So this kind of, L, some kind of LCM is taken off their periods, and they get arrived at this number. But that is what I can say. Okay. Other questions? Yes, Jan. Just a moment, I'll take the microphone. Thank you for a very interesting lecture, and well presented succinctly, so that one could really feel one understood it. I just wonder if one reason for science not progressing in India would be diffusion of knowledge because in the West we have had printing presses for some hundreds of years and I don't know about the situation in India but uh, if manuscripts are not copied and taken from place to place, uh, intellectual places, then of course things might dry up quite quickly. So could this be one reason the diffusion of knowledge was slow or deficient in India or has been? You, you mean te technological devices? Well, or devices for passing on, for example, the Kerala knowledge to other places in India where people could take up the threads and carry it forward. Were the manuscripts getting around India in that time, or did they remain in one place? Because that would influence the diffusion of knowledge and the development of knowledge. 
No, I, I don't have any comment on. Okay. <laughs> so, yes. yeah. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Thank you. What are you interested in right now about cosmology or astronomy? What do I? Okay, that was a very important question now, and you are the only one who can answer it. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? What are the questions again? What? So, so what are you right now interested in? Are you interested in cosmology, astronomy, or something else? In science. Yeah. Well, uh, I am interested in many aspects of astronomy. Uh, so one, one is, uh, uh, I would really like to see evidence on how old the stars can be. You know, there are some stars which are as old as the sun, some are older. So I am interested in the oldest type of stars, because that is related to the nature of the universe. Then I am also uh, interested in any technological progress that can help observing the universe, you know, astronomical observations can be helped by technology. And it has, they have been helped, and any new thing I am interested in. What kind of technology, what kind of observation you would like to? Well, for, for example, if we can look at very old galaxies, yeah, so very far away galaxies, I see. Yeah. then at the moment uh, we can vaguely see the colors of these galaxies. Mm -hmm. The question is how can we d get a more clear picture okay. of yeah. such galaxies? Because that would be very relevant to the issue of whether the universe is as most people yeah. think it is or different. Okay, thank you. Mm. Yes. I must admit, Professor Nalikar, that this question of the age of galaxies is indeed not only an intriguing one, but at least in equal measure, a very, very challenging one. My objection to the concept of age, as we indulge ourselves in, is the following. Why is it necessary to assume that the oldest galaxies have to be somewhere far away? Or in other words, is there any logical compulsion for us to impress ourselves with the idea that younger galaxies must be found only in our vicinity. I would very much appreciate your thoughts on this objection that I present. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, let me come to the oldest old galaxies. Why I would like them to be very far away. The reason is the following, that but suppose the galaxy that you see from your telescope uh, is so far away that light has taken, let us say, uh, 10 billion years to come to us, right? And then uh, you ask, what is this galaxy, how old is the galaxy that I see? Now, if it is very old, let us say it is, uh, say, 15 gig giga year old, then you have to add 10 to 15, that is 25 giga year from the birth of the galaxy to present. And that makes it very difficult to accommodate in a universe which is only 14 giga year old. So I am interested in such anomalous galaxies 
which will tell us something new. If you see an old galaxy nearby, then you are not going to get any further information. I mean, not, you will get some information, but not for the age. Yeah, it, it, very much it's been questioned that uh, how the galaxies looked like at, uh, at yeah. a long time ago. Yeah. So that certainly the galaxies nearby may be as old as anything, any galaxy far from us, but we can only see them as what they are today. So that's the way of, of go getting information from, from old time mm, mm. To, look, to, to look object at a uh, very high distance. Yeah, so I, would, I would say, I mean, yeah. if, you, if your universe <coughs> started with a Big Bang and galaxies formed subsequently, then the more distant galaxies should be young because they had not much time to form. And so whether this pattern is seen consistently in the universe is important. We should look for it. Okay. Was that, uh, was that answer to your question now? Okay. This may not sound... An, like a new argument, but I do have a bone of contention there. If I am to receive something 10 billion years later, then I have to be at that point in space 10 billion years later to receive it. But to arrive there, I should have traveled at a speed faster than that of light. If I do not travel at a speed faster than the speed of light, then I cannot be there at that point in space to receive light 10 billion years later. Now, I'm using a baby's logic. It has absolutely nothing to do with any calculation. It has absolutely nothing to do with any science at all. But I do have this problem. And I don't know what to do about it unless I give up science as we know it. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> Can you a little bit focus your question? <laughs> yes. To receive you here, 5,000 kilometers away from where you were born, I had to come here faster than you. If I had not come here faster than you, then I would not be in a position to receive you here. And that is the problem. If you are traveling at the maximum possible speed, and I am here, and I have traveled here faster than you, then I must see a frown on your head. I don't. And that is what is my problem. Okay. Do you think your problem will be solved here? <laughs> it may be very, very, very difficult here yeah, if we need <coughs> superluminal speeds to see ourselves. I'd like to sit down. Can I take a chair? Sorry. Can I take a chair to sit? No, I would like to sit down. Okay, yeah. If I can. Sure. Yeah. I, I will reply by. by I think that at this time we can thank uh, Professor Narlikar for his for his lecture and.
and uh, we can finish for, for this night. Thank you very much indeed.